Hey, what's up everyone? Michael Fry, President and CEO of Deepwater Subsea. I want to welcome you to what we're going to call the first edition of the Daily Grind Live. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing this this way is because it gives us the opportunity to interact with you. And, and there's a lot of people who, after we post our videos online, come back with comments and questions. And we felt it was important to be able to interact with you guys, um, you know, like we're doing now, interact live. So one of the things that I want to talk about real quick is if you ever have, if you have any questions about the things that we're going over, if you just want to hear a topic that, that comes up for discussion, underneath the, the camera down here, there's a, a questions box or a topic suggestion box. Please feel free to type in any questions that you might have, and then what we'll do is we'll get them up on the, on the show and we'll have a discussion with them. Uh, one of the special things for today's episode is we have three guests who um, are, are good friends of ours here at Deepwater Subsea. And we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. The goal for this show is to run approximately, you know, a half hour, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but we want to give you an opportunity to have discussions to learn about not only what we're doing here at Deepwater Subsea, but also things that we deal with each and every day on the daily grind. And what the daily grind really is, is in this downturn market, we're all facing challenges with trying to, you know, either get back into the marketplace or better ourselves in the various positions that we're at within our companies. I started the daily grind. Uh, we'll call it tomorrow will be episode number 70. So about, you know, 12 weeks ago. Um, we hustle each and every day here at Deepwater Subsea and our goal is to be able to give back to the industry. You know, one of, one of the guys on my team, Dallas Bozeman, who will be coming on here in a little bit. Um, I'd ask him one day, you know, what is it about Deepwater Subsea? If you had to tell somebody about what we do, um, what could you do in four words? He says, Deepwater Subsea, changing lives, changing industry. And that's something that we really focus on is trying to give back to the communities, give back to the people that support us, give back to our veterans, you know, people who are in need. And we do that each and every day as part of the daily grind. So the goal for this show is to be able to have live interaction, to be able to give back to the communities, and to be able to teach you some stuff and some things that hopefully help you progress and get back into the game if you're struggling to get back in the marketplace. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, our brand new leadership course. Uh, I'm going to bring Dallas on here in a second and let him tell you a little bit about it. But what's important to understand is our leadership course is unlike any leadership course that's currently offered in the industry today. The reason for that is we built this course for oil and gas supervisors. Too many courses that are available in the marketplace are all built for the guys who wear suits. They don't really have quality programs that are built for the true offshore supervisor. And, and that's why the team and I here at Deepwater Subsea thought it was very important to put together a course that would be able to address these issues. I'm going to turn here for a minute because it's getting a little bright. Um, again, what I want to do is I want to bring Dallas on. We're going to talk a little bit about the class, talk about some of the things that we've been seeing, and uh, let Dallas tell you a little bit about what went into the development of this course. Um, so let me just uh, bring Dallas on here. We'll get right into it. Hey, Dallas. Uh, we'll try this again in a second. Sorry. Dallas, can you hear me? Guess that would be a no. All right, well, we'll let Dallas get his computer figured out and we'll uh, we'll get it set up and ready to go. To start off, what went into the development of this leadership course was first and foremost, there's three main areas that we look at. Um, number one is being able to manage yourself. And what's important about that is a lot of people today are very weak when it comes to emotional intelligence. And the, the thought process is, <laughs> excuse me, is that it's very touchy-feely. And unfortunately, emotional intelligence isn't about, you know, psychology. Well, it is a little bit about psychology, but it's not this touchy-feely, lay back in the chair, tell me what you're feeling type of stuff. It really comes down to do you understand yourself, not only as an as a individual in the workplace, but can you manage your emotions? Do you have self-awareness? Do you have self-control? Do you have the ability to have empathy, to have motivation? You know, and that's something that's very important when it comes to being a leader in today's industry. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that. We do a great job at training people how to be um, technicians. We do a horrible job in training people on how to be leaders. So uh, let's try to bring Dallas back in, see what we got, and uh, we'll go from there. Hey, Mike, can you hear hey, me? Hey, Dallas. 
I can hear you. Welcome Good. on board. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about, you know, when, when you started developing this advanced leadership course, some of the things that went into, you know, your methodology for, for building, you know, what we discuss. Yeah, when we, when we started developing the course, the point was, was we wanted to be unique. We wanted to be different than anyone else. So other than providing a, a set of tools and saying, hey, this is what's going to make you a better leader, what we started off doing was, hey, let's start developing people. Let's look at them, see what it takes to develop personalities, to find out what people's character and values are, and play into that strength. So when we developed this course, it was all about how to manage yourself. How are you going to define yourself, find your own vision, your own purpose, your own passion, and pursue those things, and then how to implement that in an organization. So find the things you're passionate about, find what your strengths are, and, and then figure out how that not only benefits you, but how it can benefit your organization moving forward. Now, your background obviously is military. My background is military. Um, our two other guests that are coming on today are also military. What, what did you see the transition from when you got out of the Air Force to, um, I guess, the deficiencies that supervisors in oil and gas have today? Yeah, I think the deficiencies were in the in the leadership development side of the house. Uh, whenever you moved into oil and gas, uh, you know, leadership has become uh, an afterthought. People are moving out of peer groups. Uh, they go on uh, operations together. They work in the same environment, same departments, and then they come back a hitch later. And now one guy's in a leadership role, one guy's in a peer group. They haven't been taught how to handle those situations. So how do you have those critical conversations? How do you set expectations? How do you establish boundaries? Uh, and how do you start to develop those traits that are going to make you a good leader? Uh, in the military side, that was at the forefront. It was uh, the, the constant great turnover. There was always somebody who had the leadership and ability to replace me uh, if I had to move on to another assignment or unfortunately something happened. Oil and gas industry, again, like I said, kind of an afterthought. Uh, if I move on to another opportunity or somebody has to replace me, uh, have I trained them up to that ability? Do they have the leadership skills? Do they have the leadership know-how to step into that role? And that's something that the industry's failed at doing, I feel like. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, you, you kind of mentioned about the great crew change. There's a lot of discussion over the gas today where everybody talks about, oh, the, the great crew change is taking place. And one of the things I always throw out there is, you know, for me coming out of the Navy, the U.S. Navy has approximately 300,000 people on active duty. Approximately 40,000 people join the service every year. So there's obviously a high turnover where people are coming and going. But unfortunately, business has always done the same way each and every time. And I think the reason, well, I know the reason for that is it's because we start the development at the base level. You know, when you first join, everybody is taught the exact same thing. And as you progress, that the foundation has been established. And you don't have this kind of my way, your way, his way, her way. It's just it is the way. Um, when you started developing this leadership course, I mean, tell me a little bit about it. I mean, I know there's three core areas, you know, managing yourself, managing, you know, up, managing down. Tell me a little bit about what went into that and, you know, kind of some of the things that you, you cover in your in the course. Yeah, the philosophy was was that our priority should be managing yourself. Uh, if you don't know how to manage your own emotions, your, your own self-awareness, if you can't manage your own time or your own goals, then I, your ability to manage other people and your relationships is going to be hindered. So our first priority, of course, is learn how to manage your own expectations, find out what your strengths are, find out where your room is for improvement. But most of all, focused on what your purpose is, what's your drive, what's your passion, and utilizing that in the organization. Uh, after that, we move into managing your relationship with your boss, managing relationships with subordinates, and then moving into the greater picture, uh, how to manage teams and how to lead those teams in crisis. Uh, do you think it's something, I mean, can you, I, I've heard people say that you can you can train leaders. I mean, do, is that something that you believe or is it something that has to be developed over time? I, I believe this is something that's developed over time. I don't believe you can train somebody, give them a, a week's worth of information and turn them loose and say, hey, congratulations, you're a leader. Uh, one of the guys in our course this week made a great statement. He said, this was this course is an awakening. And that's exactly what its purpose is. I'm not here to give you a tool and say five days later you're, you're going to be a leader. It's I'm going to try to bring out characteristics that you already have, pull out your own values, and show you how to apply that into your leadership role. No, I think that's good. I think it's really good. And the thing that's important is 
you know, this happens a lot with just courses in general in oil and gas, you know, or in, in any industry with adult learning is you go to a course, they hand you that certificate and then they go, great, you've been trained, now go, go do what you're supposed to do. The reality is, is we know that the learning and forgetting curve takes place where as soon as you walk out of the classroom, you start forgetting the information. So I think it's very important um, you know, one of the things you guys are going to be going over tomorrow is actually establishing goals that, that you want to reach after you leave the class. I think it's something that's very important that everybody everybody should do as part of their learning and as part of the development of anything that they do. I mean, learning a new skill is great, but if you don't actually put it to use, you know, it, it was a waste at the end of the day. Yeah, today we talked about how to have critical conversations and, and how to deal with conflict and in the workplace and at home and in your life in general, but we also said whenever you go home tonight, now's the time to start applying this. It's a perishable skill. So as things arise, as you communicate with your, your wife, your kids, in your work environment when you go back, don't avoid those opportunities to develop that skill set. And, and then going in starting tomorrow's class, we're going to be uh, creating the individual development plans. So what they're going to do is they're going to take the material that uh, they've been presented with this week, uh, their own personal findings and and the things that they found out about themselves and their leadership styles. And then they're going to create a plan uh, with goals over the next, you know, the next six months, the next year, the next three years. And they're going to start steering themselves uh, purposefully towards something bigger than themselves. No, that's good. Let me ask you this question. It was one of the things that we did talked about when we put the course together. Um, you know, we have discussions about that this class is not for the suits. It's for the, for the end users, the guys in the field, you know, What's the difference between leadership for you know executive management and leadership for the guys who are actually your frontline supervisors? Uh, I believe it's the personal aspect. When we start doing leadership training for executives, it's, it's about group management and, and organizational management. Uh, what we lack, especially in a blue collar industry, is uh, the knowledge of how to build relationships and maintain relationships and, and get down uh, to leadership on a personal level. Uh, very rarely do we give guys the tools uh, to walk into a situation and, and know how to have empathy, uh, how to control expectations of our peers, uh, how to deal with our personal life. Uh, whether we like it or not, those uh, that character and value is getting brought into the workplace. So are those family relationships and, and work conflicts. So as somebody comes in uh, who has real personal struggles, uh, as a leader, you need to develop that skill set. And if you could do me a favor just real quick, you know, I think it's important for the development of this class. Tell me a little bit about what you did in the Air Force and why situational awareness and just some of the different leadership, you know, traits that you had to kind of evolve um, in a combat zone really played into, you know, the execution of this class. Right. So when I started developing this class, I started looking at the leadership traits uh, that were presented to me in the military, but also my, my previous experiences. I had the opportunity uh, as an explosive ordnance disposal technician. Uh, I was a team leader that was charged with disarming bombs. Uh, I got attached to many special operations units, uh, foreign services, and because of that, I was removed from a common environment and, and placed within teams, uh, almost like a third party contractor, somebody that was new, uh, hadn't been in the, the tribal system and, and had to present myself in a, in a good way. And the leadership challenges that came out of that was integration into teams, and also management in high stress environments. Uh, obviously, I have my own small team that I have to manage within a, a larger picture. So how to manage those relationships, how to not force issues, um, uh, not to force an invitation at the table, how to show my value by, by helping out in scenarios. And, and then after building what I call relationship equity, uh, then moving forward, because I think it's important that as we build our teams and we develop that we not only pour into uh, our personnel and rejoice when they rejoice, be sad for them when they're sad. That way we have the equity when something goes uh, goes awry or we have to have a critical conversation. I've invested the time in that person that now they're going to buy into, uh, they're going to trust me, and I'm going to have enough equity built up uh, that we can continue to steer the team in the right direction. No, I think that's good. What I want to do is bring on uh... – Two other gentlemen that have been in the class, both guys are, are military leaders. Um, I think it's good because as we've been going through this leadership course, having guys who are like-minded, who have been through that foundation, that fundamental training, um, has really been a, you know, a key part to, the, to kind of the evolution of where we're at in oil and gas. So what I'd like to do is bring on uh, DJ and Gary to talk a little bit more about 
some of the things that they've seen because they've been in the industry as well for quite a while. And uh, I think it's all part of the daily grind of what we deal with. So. Hey, DJ. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. How about you, Gary? How about you, Gary? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. So we'll just move forward with you. Okay, I'm going to refresh. DJ, tell me a little bit about some of the challenges that you had. I mean, obviously, you're a military guy as well that's crossed over to the oil and gas industry. Um, part of the daily grind, part of the challenge that you face uh, actually is one of the things that we're going to talk about is just the, the hustle of trying to get back into the industry because of the downturn. Um, tell me yep. a little bit about your transition from the military and, and the values that you see in having this type of leadership training. So, yeah, thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm, I'm a 10-year removed military transition veteran. I've uh, been out in the workforce for about 10 years now. Been with Transocean for eight, and I'm getting ready to depart and look for a new opportunity. Uh, part of that is, is because of the downsizing. And uh, I would say that the challenge right now that veterans are facing is uh, most companies, as they collapse, they're looking for subject matter experts. They want a guy who's got 5, 10, 15, 20 years experience at doing this. And you stick a military guy in a role, and they've got leadership, they've got technical aptitude, but they don't have 15 years doing X. And so it's not surprising that you'll see a lot of veterans possibly on the street right now. Uh, is it the right move? I, uh, not for me to say. I'm partially biased since I'm out on the street. But uh, I would say that companies have to look at their, their talent, their strength. And what a lot of companies are doing right now is they're downsizing and right-sizing, high-grading people into the right opportunities, uh, looking at tomorrow's future. I think they're making a mistake by not maintaining a high level of uh, military infusion into their organization because we do bring those intangible skill sets that they want for tomorrow's leadership. No, I think it's I think you're absolutely right, and that's one of the big challenges. Is you know there's so much weight put on the fact of how long have you been in a position versus what can you actually deliver at the end of the day. And unfortunately, just because somebody doesn't have 20 years in a position doesn't mean that they're actually a subject matter expert. I've seen guys who. You know, my background was U.S. Navy working on nuclear submarines. I mean, I moved up very quickly in, in my career because I took extreme ownership in the work that we did. And unfortunately, I think that's something that gets missed. Um, now that you're kind of transitioning, what are some of the challenges that you see trying to get back into the workplace? So, uh, you know, first is just it, it comes back to supply and demand. Uh, at this point, you've got so many people in the Houston area in oil and gas out of a job looking for the same jobs that your recruiting staff is inundated with, you know, 30, 50 qualified individuals for each position that they've got to fill. Um, so obviously getting recognized uh, is, is uh, problematic, can be a challenge. So the first thing people have to ask themselves is, what am I doing to separate myself from everybody else applying for the same job? Um, how am I best using my time? Am I do I even know what I want? Are my priorities focused? Am I applying for a shotgun approach to 8,000 jobs out there? Or am I staying within the passion and skill set of what I want to do? How's my network? Do I have a good network of people that are championing for me? Uh, it's almost like owning real estate versus having a job. Both provide income, but one is direct and one's passive. When you have a network of people that are championing for you, that's like passive income. They're out there pushing your resume, pushing your talents, pushing your potential, and, and that's all working in your favor and putting time back on your plate, like Dallas said today, for creating that margin, uh, making sure that you have that good work-life balance and, and keeping your family as a priority and not just staying focused on a desperate hunt for the next job. You know, you know that's a good point. I think it's, it's something that you know, we talk about a lot with the Daily Grind stuff is, you know, what are you doing to differentiate yourself from your competition? And as you said, you know, the network can be a huge thing. I mean, when, when Dallas and I first started talking, you know, I knew Dallas from a, from a previous employer. What I also knew about Dallas is Dallas had, you know, certain intangibles that I wasn't going to be able to get somewhere else. So when Dallas became available, it was, it was that fast. You know, but Dallas and I joke, 
Dallas came into the office one day and the next day he came in for, you know, just to sit around and have a little BS session. I was like, here's a job. He was like, what? I mean, thankfully for us, Dallas accepted it. But if, if Dallas and I didn't have that, that pre-established, you know, network and that, um, you know, we were, we were acquaintances. I, I wouldn't say we were really friends at the time, Dallas. I mean, we, we kind of passed each other in the hallways. We had some discussions and we said, Hey, look, we, I think you'd be a great fit for us. And, you know, he thought he'd be a great fit for us too. And then the opportunity kind of fell into place. And, and so I think it's, it's definitely important to stay not only positive, um, because this, this grind can really wear you down. I mean, the challenge is, is where is the end? You know, and unfortunately for a lot of people, it's wake up. It's kind of like losing weight. I know it's not the same thing, but it's like you wake up on Monday and you go, you know what, I'm going to go to the gym and, and I'm, I'm ready to go. And then after day one, day two, you're kind of good. Well, day three, it starts to hurt a little bit. And you're kind of that chicken doesn't taste quite as good as that pizza did last week. And then you finally go, you know what, screw this, I'll just be fat. And unfortunately, if you don't have those goals and you don't have that drive and you don't have that Sometimes, you know, one of my favorite books is The 48 Laws of Power, and it talks about putting yourself on death's ground, where you're actually pushed yourself in, up against the wall, where you got to fight like hell to get out. And being a Navy guy, I was kind of spoiled. You know, we were thousands of miles away. We're launching cruise missiles. It's like, hey, we'll see you guys later. You guys who are, who are the, the boots on the ground, you know, really in the heat of combat, I mean, I know it's different because it's life and death, but the reality is you have to be in that situation to go, I will do whatever it takes to put food back on the table to get back in the game. And it might not be what I'm used to doing. I might not be making $200,000 a year. I might be making $60,000 a year. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss out on. Gary, what about you? I mean, Gary, you're a, you're a military officer who's made the transition. What do you see for as far as the need for leadership and a lot of these other things? You know, it, it's it's a good question, Mike. First off, thank you guys for having me. Uh, very honored to be here. Uh, I think the industry in itself today is in more need of leadership than it's ever been because we're going in this cyclical downturn. And just like in the military, when you're in a combat situation, what's the one thing that your subordinates and sometimes even those above you, what's the one thing that they're looking for to make it out of that combat situation or the cyclical downturn and its leadership? I think right now, as we go through the downturn, you're going to see, and we are seeing, you know, some companies are, are, are getting rid of the proverbial low-hanging fruit. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for guys, number one, not only within the company to prove their leadership and their worth and to use this as a bit of a, a stepping stone to get themselves some, some additional longevity, but also for the guys that, that, that might be laid off, like myself last year I was laid off, but also the guys coming out of the military and entering the job force to make themselves marketable because that leadership that they have, it's second to none. So it just builds in, and I told Dallas this the other day, it just builds into the courses like this, this advanced leadership course. You take what's being presented in this advanced leadership course and you put that in your kit bag and you're able to go into interviews and you're able to do the, the conversations with potential hiring managers and you make yourself more marketable because number one, you've got some experience under your belt, but number two, you know a little bit more about leadership than you did the previous month. So to answer your question, I think in the times that we're seeing, man, leadership is paramount. And I think the guys that have the ability to lead, not only just be a manager, but also to be a leader, are going to be uh, are going to be the guys that are really sought after in this market. Yeah, and I think that the challenge is, is unfortunately, um, getting that opportunity. I mean, like you said, you know, there's a lot of guys who are very high quality people. And unfortunately, when the market just makes its determination to let you go, it lets you go. And as we talked in class, it doesn't matter if you're number one in the company, if you happen to be on that vessel that's getting cut, you're getting cut. Yeah. What I wanna do is I wanna bring no, you a guest real quick. Um, so, so Dallas, we're gonna give you a break here for a second. David, can you hear me? Yes. Tell me what's on your mind. Welcome to the Daily Grind. We appreciate you coming on board. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. 
y'all are, y'all are technically advanced in, in all aspects of getting out there and reaching all, all of us guys out there that, uh, well, like myself, I just uh, told you that I'd been, uh, basically had to resign my position to, uh, to, uh, get the rest of, to liquidate, liquidate the rest of my assets in my 401k just to, uh, continue to support my family and keep my house. Uh, our dream house we bought two years ago, I probably should have, uh, a cheaper house, but uh, hindsight's 2020. I'm going to go on with a positive attitude and uh, keep on uh, looking for new opportunities. I have a few uh, things out there still. I, I'm not going to give up on my subsea career. I've worked long and hard to uh, to, to get into subsea and to learn learn the business and uh, learn the equipment. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give up on it. I, I know there's still work out there, and like I said, I'm, I'm still waiting on a company or two to get back with me on that. But uh, uh, it's it's been hard. I've been in. I started with uh, Otis Engineering in 1979. I ran the test wells there for Otis and Halliburton for 11 years. I've, I've been in this business for a long time. Uh, this is the fourth downturn that I've uh, gone through. Uh, I was uh, basically in good positions for the last three, and I was able to keep my job in the oil field and keep working at that time. But uh, this, by far, has uh, really been the worst for me. Uh, I mean, I, my whole family's worked for Elders Engineering in Halliburton since 1958. My sister and brother-in-law are still with Halliburton. Uh, they're teetering on the edge of uh, basically bankruptcy is basically what I've been hearing through the through the grapevine. So this 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 market is, is hurting right now. But uh, then you see the downstream side, uh, the pipelines and, and, the, and the refineries, they're, they're still hitting on all cylinders. Uh, and that's something that I would, you know, a lot of guys out there don't really realize uh, it's getting the employers and stuff in these downstream companies to realize that your that your technical skills that you may have learned in, on the upstream side and stuff like that can relate to the downstream side. I, 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 I've been building gate valves and stuff for 20 years, you know, that it, a valve's a valve to me, you know, there's, there's nothing out there that I can't do. I'm not going to uh, uh, give up. Uh, I, I don't feel that there's any job that I can't go out there and, and do and do well. I've, I've got a sales background and I'm a lifelong mechanic. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to get depressed. I'm just going to keep looking. So David, let me ask you this question. I, I appreciate you. I mean, obviously you follow us on the social medias and, and I'm very grateful for that. What advice would you have for someone who's gone through the downturn for the first time? I mean, you've mentioned you've been through a couple of them, but you know, you never see it until it's on top of you. And unfortunately, I say this is the worst downturn that my generation's ever seen because a lot of guys have never actually seen a true downturn. What well, advice this, would this, you have for someone? I'd, I'd, be, I'd, I'd advise them to, to, you know, you know, do what you have to do to feed your family and stuff. I mean, that's that's the first one. You got to pay bills, so you know, get your get your get get another job. You're not going to make the same money. That's that's for sure. Uh, but but don't give up. Uh, don't give up on it. It's always come back. Uh, this one, this this downturn is completely different from the other ones because the other ones we kind of saw coming. You could see that coming, and people had basically time to prepare for these. The way this one came about, uh, you know, the Saudis, whoever, you know, opening up the refineries and the OPEC deal, whatever. I mean, that's that's where it's rooted from. I mean, you open up the valves and let the oil, you know, fill up the reserves. This is what happens. Um, it hit quick. It's the way it hit quick. People don't, uh, oil and gas is A to Z on, I mean, every aspirin, everything comes from oil and gas. People do not realize the trickle down effect that this is actually going to have. And it will continue until the price goes up into the mid 50s or 60s, 65 or so right there, I believe, is when exploration would come back. Um, I I, can't, I I would just keep trying. I I'm I'm not gonna. I'm I'm one of these positive peoples. I'm I'm relentlessly positive. I I you know can't never did nothing. That's the way I. Although I don't have the military background, even when I was a sales manager and stuff, the guys called me Sergeant McKay because that's the way you guys that have been in the military. That's the way this business should be run. I have never. Y'all 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 starting this leadership class and everything like this for these guys out here. I've been in the oil field for over 25 years, and I've never seen anybody take the initiative to actually put that out there. Well, with, with social media and everything, especially now, it's, it's really getting out there. Uh, nobody has ever taken the effort to do that. I mean, 
we, we know in subsea and everything that, hey, you know, that, that subsea senior, he could quit and go to another rig, and there's that, there's that uh, you know, next guy jumping in line, and he, he doesn't have any leadership abilities or whatever. He doesn't know how to get his guys or motivate his guys to work. The, the first thing that usually happens to these guys is they, they start barking orders to these guys, and, you know, hey, you know, yesterday you were just, just like me, another grunt, and now you're my boss, and you're treating me like dirt, you know. These guys need to be trained on how to how to motivate their employees, and you know, I, I never ask any of the any of the guys that I supervise. I never told them to do something. I asked them to do something. I would ask them once, then I'd ask them twice. On the third time, and I had to repeat myself. Then I would tell them. I mean, but I think any any of you guys that have been in the military, it's I think I'm right around the same lines on how y'all would handle the situation like that. But uh, it, the the deal is is that yeah it, it it's it's happened before and and it and it's and it'll happen again in the future but it will come back I mean there is there is a uh, there is there is nothing that we can see or touch in our daily lives right now that that don't use oil yeah you know, our refineries and everything are or you know are, are filled up and all that stuff but hey you know uh, let's let's see how the election goes and see what happens on the later part of the year. I, I think something's gonna it'll it'll pop back into the 60s by 2017. So, so again, I'm just gonna try to hang in there and get with somebody that still has work, you know. <laughs> and and uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. I you... go back to turning wrenches, man. I, I sales wrenches, whatever. I'll, I'll I'll tell them all, you know. So. Are you in the uh, Are you in the Houston area? Yes, I'm in Magnolia right now. I just resigned from Lloyd's Register as a BOP DT surveyor. I was actually an, a field service technician for uh, National Oil Barco. I'm basically a shaper expert on that stuff. But I've I've been I've been turning wrenches for a long time. So. No, that's good. Well, do the do me a favor. Um, you know, the good thing about the daily grind is you never know what opportunities come your way. Um, we actually are in the need of an NOV uh, SME. So if you could do me a favor, you got time tomorrow to maybe swing by the office. Um, I would love to tomorrow. My wife is. Uh, we're going cheap now, you know. <laughs> My wife actually volunteered for the Houston Rodeo, and tomorrow is her last shift, and I have to get her up there by 3 p.m. Uh, she volunteers basically for uh, uh, four eight-hour shifts, and then she gets she has the gold badge, and she's been uh, running in and out with her. We we actually have company in from the UK. My daughter's uh, uh, boyfriend and his mom are here, with, staying with me in the house. And they're going to the rodeo back and forth. But uh, Friday, I'll be open, and I'll be more than happy to come well, swing, by. Swing by Friday, and uh, let's have a discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, and and again, I I I totally. Since you, I I was one of the first ones to really link up with you on LinkedIn. I don't know that. I know you. I know I know you from somewhere somewhere back or whatever. And I and I and I said, yeah, I know I know that guy. And. Uh, and I've been following you ever since, and everything you guys are doing is is something I was going like, where the heck has this guy been? Before? Where has he been? I am I couldn't be you know more prouder of a guy doing what you're doing, Michael. And uh, and I think you're I, I think you're right on track, man. You, you guys no, got it. Good. Going I appreciate on. it. Well, do this. Come come see me on Friday. Um, I'll be here all morning. If you could swing in first thing, we're just right off 99, so it'd be good. Um, bring your sure. resume and you never know what opportunities uh, might be available. You got it, sir. All right. Gary, kind of going back to you, I mean, we were talking about this earlier and, and David brought up a good point of, you know, being that supervisor for the first time, being that leader showing up to a new group of guys. What were some of the challenges, especially being a, you know, kind of a field, oh, not being kind of, but being a field officer in the Army in a combat area? having to show up to a group of guys and go, guess what, I'm your new supervisor? You know, man, it's a very good question. And Dallas and I actually brought up this topic in the course either yesterday or the day before. And, you know, I think when you're a fresh military guy, and it doesn't matter whether you're an officer or a senior NCO or a junior NCO, when you come into that supervisor role, the first and only thing that your new group of subordinates are going to look at you for is humility and your ego. You know, all too often, I'm sure you've seen it, I've seen it a number of times, all too often we get these guys that come into their new unit, their new uh, company, their new business, whatever the case might be, and they bring in this mentality.
No, that's good. I mean, it's a good point that you bring up. Um, so just kind of moving forward just real quick. Sorry to change gears a second. Um, you know, DJ brought up a good question, talking about BUPs and stuff, just, just briefly for a moment. You know, Diamond and GE have this new agreement that's out there in the industry. And what's, what's interesting is a lot of people don't understand the behind the scenes that's going on with it. And we are actually the company that's doing the training for the GE guys who are going offshore. And what what the the agreement is, and, and to to DJ's question about, you know, do we think that more companies will kind of follow in the footsteps of of the Diamond GE agreement? I think there will be more companies that go down the line of trying to do this. The challenge for them is when is the right transition to take place? And and what I mean by that is the maintenance is going to be done the BUPs on deck. The maintenance is going to be done by GE, GE and their, their teams. When the BUPs on bottom, it still remains with diamond. And where does that transition happen when, you know, things start going wrong? Do, are they really field service guys? Or are they, they truly BUP guys? I think on paper, it looks really good. I think the execution is going to be very important. And it goes back to everything we've been talking about in the class and everything we talk about with the daily grind, which is, having the right people in place for the execution of the work. Does that make sense, TJ? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. I think it's gonna take uh, some practical application, uh, some actual execution operation time where they're gonna have to come into some issues and say, okay, we didn't consider that. Uh, where's the transition between our people and your folks? Uh, what does the liability look uh, language look like in the contract? Um, a lot of questions that, uh, that an outsider I find interesting having a marketing and contract background. So um, I, I just, I'll be real interested to see how it plays out. And I, I hope it works. Uh, and I hope more people go to that. Sort yeah, of, you know, uh, I think uh, it's, process. I think the challenge is going to be is you, <laughs> excuse me, the challenge is going to be you have to breathe while you're talking. Um, the challenge is going to be is, is, again, having the right people. And unfortunately, when you're going through this big transition, this big boom that's going to take place again, if you don't hire the right people, you're never going to be successful at it. And it doesn't matter if it's here at Deepwater Subsea or if it's at GE or if it's at Cameron. You have to have the right people in place for the execution of the work. So I think you'll see other drilling contractors We'll look at it from a financial because subsea downtime is one of the biggest downtimes that anybody has. And any chance that a drilling contractor could go, oh, we're going to give it back to you and you take some of the downtime, I think they'll try to see value in it. It's just how does the execution of it take place at the end of the day? Gary, do me a favor. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Hey, go ahead, quick on that. I'm... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just... I was just saying, you recall from a few years ago where suddenly everyone was required to have specific, uh, you know, regulatory uh, BOP, there were BOP requirements, and suddenly Cameron and Hydro were so swamped with backlog work, it was three years before you were going to see a new BOP. So kind of along those same lines, if the industry picks back up, and let's say Diamond, just for example, let's just stick with them, let's say all the rigs go back to work, does Cameron have the manpower, or are they thinking about the manpower needed to be able to handle all of those rigs with the not just yeah, and I think oh, that's a great question. And that's you know, when I talk about the perfect storm taking place, is when the industry goes to go back to work, and we have the new Bessie regulations that come out that say, oh, we got to have all these new inspections. Where are the drilling contractors and the OEMs going to get these people from? Because as David mentioned a little while ago, he's been released or he's left LR. A lot of these service companies are cutting people out. The the Slumberjays, the Camerons, the NOVs, you know, our, our competition is fortunately for us, we're hiring. Um, but you're going to get that perfect storm, which is a rush of all these new people coming back in. And again, if you don't have the foundation built, you're going to see massive amounts of, of not only issues personality wise, but issues with operations and operational excellence. Dallas, Dallas, if you would just just kind of, you know, going back to the leadership thing against again. When when you were going out to the rigs, um, tell me a little bit about some of the challenges. And, and actually, you know, before I step back from that, Gary, what are your thoughts being a you know global training manager 
when you're working with your customers, what are the things that you're hearing and what are the things that you're seeing currently in the, in the marketplace today? Uh, well, it varies. It, 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 it's obviously all swaying towards the fact that, you know, unfortunately, uh, cuts are imminent. You know, I don't think there's any company that is uh, germane or, or uh, on the other end of the spectrum has a monopoly on cutting people. It's uh, sitting from where I'm sitting, and you guys probably have similar viewpoints. I don't think we're, we're, we're done with, unfortunately, the job losses. Uh, I can tell you from, from my point of view, I see uh, daily uh, guys that either hit me up on Facebook, LinkedIn, or text message, email, saying, hey, man, I just lost my job. Do you know of anything that's on the radar? And, you know, nine times out of ten, it's, it's guys I never would have thought that have, would have lost their job. I mean, there's some good talent out there. So from my customer base, you know, it's, it's, they're making the cuts as they need to make the cuts, and they're thinking those cuts through as professionals. And at the end of the day, number one, nobody wants to make cuts because you're affecting families. But the shareholders, the board of directors, and those different entities within that company – you know, they have vested interest in doing whatever they need to do to keep that company upright and moving forward in a progressive manner now, but also to set them up for success in the in the future when this does turn around, and it will turn around. So I, I, I tell people, you know, coming as a, a former recruiting manager of North America Transocean, this is a prime time. I know from experience, this is a prime time to snag up some very good talent. There is some talent out there that's being let go that have some solid resumes. And the companies that are strategically playing this in a very smart manner are snagging up some of that quality talent. So it's it's uh, it's an interesting time in our industry, Mike. No, and and just one other quick question for you. I mean, when you're when you're having discussions with drilling contractors or the operators, has their needs for training changed? I mean, are they still looking for the same services, or are they starting to say? hey, well, let's cut off on this, let's just do the mandatory stuff. I mean, do they still see the value in training or are they just really just cut the budget, get rid of it? Yeah, there's a lot of budget cutting going on. You hit the nail on the head, you know. Th those things on the training metrics that are up in the top tier, as in required for that position, those are still happening. But where you're going to see the cutting off and where we are seeing the cutting off is the discretionary training. You know, okay, you need to have that course in order to be promoted, but at this point in time, we're gonna we're gonna look at that a little bit differently than we did say three years ago. So yeah, we, we do see a, a change in the training requests that are coming across our desk, but we expected it, so we were able to prepare for it. But you know, the companies are playing it smart by way of their training budget because you know you got to have that training for those specific positions to keep that rig running. But at the end of the day, you don't want to hit your discretionary training too hard and, and drain your budget so that, you know, your your mandatory training struggles. So, yeah, we, we, we've seen a change in the training request. Absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. DJ, to answer your question real quick, I think it's a good one. So we've just celebrated. DJ's question is where where do I see deep water subsea being this time next year? Um, we just celebrated our first anniversary last month. Um, we're growing. I'd say we're growing you know, fairly steadily for a startup company. Um, we, we now have eight people on the team. We're bringing on new customers, you know, I'd say monthly. Um, our goal this time next year is to have probably 10 to 15% of the market share in the Gulf of Mexico for not only BOP verification, but to have a full-time leadership class that people are coming to, to have a full-time subsea management class. You know, we've run seven classes so far. And the good thing is, is if you're bringing valued training to the industry, people will still invest in it. The challenge is, is if you're saying, hey, here's a nice to have course, people don't want to invest in that. Where will we be in five years? Five years, we'll be the premier subsea service company in, in oil and gas. Um, and the reason I believe that is we've built the foundation for this company around successful people, around subject matter experts, around leaders um, like Dallas and, and myself and other guys that we have on the team. Our, our goal 100% is to give back to our customers. It's we're looking for the relationship, not the transaction. You know, as Dallas has mentioned, changing lives, changing industry. Um, I'm not afraid of where the market's at today because again, we're in the worst downturn we've ever seen and yet we're still growing. 
Um, so I think that's a good question, and you know, hopefully this time next year we'll see. Uh, you know, we'll see where we're at. We're, we're already moving up to the top. People see us each and every day, as David had mentioned. You know, you got the daily grind. I mean, we're hustling. We're doing everything we can to really give back to the industry. And, and I think unlike our competition, who is all about me, 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 we're all about you, 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 you. So, uh, you know, another great question, DJ, is the procedural compliance in today's, you know, operations. I think procedural compliance is going to be a much bigger thing than it's ever been before. Um, I had a discussion with a CEO from one of the drilling contractors here recently who was talking about we have a massive issue with procedural discipline on our teams. <clears throat> the challenge is, is it, you know, the, the chicken or the egg? You know, do you, do you get quality people or do you get quality procedures? For me, you have to have both. I think Betsy's going to really start pushing these audits and they're really going to start doing spot checks. And for the first time in the industry, we're really going to see people being held accountable for the execution of the work that they're saying they're doing. Um, Betsy right now is already very big on let me see your test procedures and are you following them to the letter of the law? And, and I think as we kind of transition, when the swing takes place, we're going to see more and more of that. And unfortunately, it, it really shouldn't be that big of a challenge to the industry. It should just be this is the way we do business. And unfortunately, it's never been the way we do business. And that's why a lot of people are struggling at the moment. Gary, Gary, do me a favor real quick, if you would. Um, I'm interested in Dallas as well. I'll let Gary go first. Tell me a little bit about Oath and the work that you do with, with the veterans groups. And, you know, I'm, I'm throwing the links up to, to Gary's page. Um, we are huge supporters of the work that Gary does. You know, Dallas also, you know, we, we, we help support um, the, the different vet organizations. But Gary's is, in my opinion, the number one organization when it comes to truly giving back. There's none of this, you know, we're not going to see Gary in the news taking, you know, luxury cruises on the dimes in the backs of, of veterans. So, Gary, please tell me a little bit about, about Oath, what you guys do, and, and where would we go to find out more information about you guys? Uh, well, I'm, I'm humbled, Mike. I, I appreciate you uh, not only supporting Oath, but allowing me this platform to, to tell other people about it. Uh, Oath uh, stands for Outdoor Association for Texas Heroes. It's a nonprofit organization, 501c3, that, that I started back in uh, 2014. And um, the reason that I started Oath was twofold. I wanted to combine my two greatest loves outside of my family and God, and that is my fellow combat veterans in the great outdoors. So what we do at Oath is we take uh, wounded or disabled veterans from Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, and Vietnam on outdoor adventures. Now, when people hear outdoor adventures, they, they usually think just hunting and fishing, but we do so much more than that. We, we, we take people uh, hiking, we take horseback riding, we take them uh, camping, we do shark fishing, of course. Uh, we do a lot of hunting trips because predominantly most people do like to hunt or fish, but our, our events are only limited by our imagination. So anytime a veteran or someone from the general public comes up to us and says, uh, hey, this sounds like a really cool event. You guys should try it. We research it and we look at it. And if it's something that we think is feasible, we add it to the calendar, we source it, we plan it, and then we execute it. So, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, it's an all-volunteer effort, you know, from, from myself all the way down to our, our field representatives who are our pro staff that actually execute the events for us. We have uh, chapters in Texas, Utah, Idaho, and Indiana, all volunteer. No one's collecting a paycheck. We, uh, we tell each other that we, we get paid by the smiles that we put on the people's faces. And I tell you point blank, man, I, I've said it once and I'll say it a million times. When I go to these events and meet these guys and gals and, and help execute these events, I walk away from it thinking that I got more out of it than they did just because I feel so good, man. It, it fills my bucket because at the end of the day, having served two tours in combat, you know, had it been a couple feet here or a couple seconds there, it could be me on the other side of the table benefiting from Oath rather than providing it. And uh, I've known you for a long time, Mike, and uh, we go back. We're great friends. I've known Dallas, and I'll have to tell you, it's, I've always said, I've always told people, if Oath is going to succeed, it's not going to be because of me. It's not going to be because of the board of directors. It's not going to be because of my staff. It's going to be because of the generosity 
of the general population and our supporters like you guys and the wonderful folks at Deepwater Subsea. So I can't thank you enough, man, for number one, believing in us, but number two, putting your money where your mouth is and supporting us with, with, some, with some support that is unparalleled. Uh, I would love for people to go visit our website. It's right there, www.oathinc.org. Uh, take a look at our uh, our testimonials. We've got heroes' words, own words there about how they benefited from the events. We've got a pretty robust calendar of events all the way out to 2017. And, um, you know, it, just like you said about deep water subsea, I firmly believe that Oath is the best at what they do because we approach it from a different avenue of approach than any other organization, I believe. It's a faith-based organization. I'm, I'm very well in tune with my faith in love of Jesus Christ. So I, I use that every day in my approach with Oath and it's it's soul healing. We're, we're healing souls and we're saving lives, man. And I appreciate it. I thank you. No, that's, it's awesome, brother. Like I said, it's, you know, when, when you first started Oath, it was very easy for us to get on board. And, and obviously, you know, any chance that we get to give back, you know, something that we do. Dallas, just real quick, I know that you also do stuff for the veterans. You do stuff with Gary. Tell me a little bit about some of the things that you also work on. Yeah, not only do I help support uh, Gary and, and Oath Inc., uh, I also do some work with uh, Trinity Oaks. And Trinity Oaks is another faith-based organization that's very closely aligned with Oath. Um, we have a little different avenue. Gary's focus is uh, giving back to veterans and helping enrich their lives. Uh, our focus is not only dabbling in that a little bit, but we focus heavily on children you know, and children's ministries. We like to take kids that come from uh, underprivileged communities, uh, get kids in urban environments into the outdoors, see what's available to them. And it's more about building relationships than anything else, much like Othink is. It's more than getting kids out and getting them involved in hunting and fishing. And it's giving them the opportunities to, to have relationships with people who care about them, want to invest in their interests, and give them opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Right. No, that's good. Gary, hey, real quick, before we before we end this session, I'm, I'm grateful for you guys. I'm actually... I'll bring DJ back here real quick. I'm grateful for, for all of you guys for taking the time to be with us. Gary, what, what events do you guys have coming for Oath in the near future? Uh, we've got a uh, overnight fishing trip for some veterans out of Galveston. We're going to take, uh, take a couple few veterans on a 50-foot a uh, fishing boat, a sport fisher, I believe it's called, and we're going to do an overnight fishing trip. Uh, we've got uh, we've got some hunting trips come up. We've got a, a, a Neil guy bull hunt that we got from a very good supporter that we're going to we're going to make the absolute hunt of a lifetime and experience of a lifetime for one of our outdoor uh, events for one of our, our guys. We've got the Warrior Wives Retreat coming up uh, this year, which, you know, a lot of these organizations focus just on the veteran. But one of the things we do at Oath is, you know, our, our motto is strength behind the strong for this event. And what we do is we take some of the wives of these heroes to a weekend where they're pampered and they're focused on. This year we're going to Port Aransas. We rented a, a huge beach house that sleeps 20. And, you know, man, it, it's just something that needs to be done because we all know, I think we've all deployed here, we all know when we pack that bag and we go overseas, that wife, is left there. If the transmission goes out in that vehicle, she has to fix it. If Tommy, little Tommy breaks his leg, she has to take care of it. If the, if the toilet backs up and if she needs to replace it, she has to do it. You know, so a lot of times, unfortunately, those spouses fall to the wayside in terms of appreciation, but we're going to have a great event for them this year, and, and we're excited about that. Of course, we got the clay shoot coming back up in September, the third annual Oak Sporting Clay Shoot. Last year, we, we hit 143,500, praise God. So uh, we're excited about it this year. And uh, just if you look at our calendar on, on our website, man, it, it is it is peppered full of hunting and fishing and, and all kinds of good social events for these guys because that's what it's about, getting them out off of the couch and back into an arena of, of social integration so they can just hit their marks and, and, and uh, find employment and make new friends and just lead a better life that, that leads to some uh, productivity. Um, no, that's good. Well, guys, I'm, I am extremely grateful. I'm blessed to have you guys as friends. And uh, thank you very much for, for being a part of this first Daily Grind. Uh, look forward to doing more of them. Uh, definitely, definitely think there's going to be value. Uh, and, and again, if it's not for you guys, it's not for the teams. You know, at the end of the day, it's just me talking to a screen. So, so I thank you guys for all the time that you guys invest in it. Thanks for having us. So, no problem. So just to wrap it up, I want to say thank you to everybody that's been on board, men and women um, from all over the U.S., all over the world. 
Hit us up on our Facebook page. Hit us up on our website, deepwatersubsea.com. If you're on LinkedIn, check us out there too. Um, we're going to be doing this weekly. That's the ultimate goal is to constantly give back. And uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback because this is something that's going to be saved and be able to be replayed. So uh, I'm curious to see what your thoughts and your comments are on it. So please feel free at any time to shoot me an email, mike at deepwatersubsea.com. And never give up on the grind because you never want to give up on the hustle.